dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, I hope uh, now everything works well. Uh, and uh, I'm really very, very happy to welcome everyone tonight uh, at the opening event of uh, the Armed Democracy Series, uh, which we start uh, together with my uh, colleagues also from Ukraine, Natalia Humanyuk and Angelina Karyakina, whom I will introduce uh, a bit later, but first of all, very thankful uh, to you guys that you kindly found time and managed to join us uh, today. My name is uh, Vasil Cherepanin. I represent here a Visual Culture Research Center and uh, the Kyiv Biennial. <clears throat> and before we start, just a few wor organizational words from my side. And uh, first of all, let me start, start uh, this event um, by thanking to the uh, foremost Ukrainian military, of course, to civic resistance and uh, volunteers networks and so on. But uh, it's only thanks to the Ukrainian military that we can uh, sit here today in Ukraine, uh, having uh, this uh, unbelievable privilege uh, to have a light in our houses, running water and pretty good internet connection unlike uh, millions of our compatriots, because without them, uh, this just uh, wouldn't be possible. And uh, I think that those uh, in the West uh, uh, of Europe uh, would be busy with totally different uh, talks uh, at the moment. So thanks so much again for this. And. Um, this uh, armed, armed democracy series, uh, which uh, will be uh, conducted in, uh, in an online format uh, from today till the 9th of July, so basically a bit more than a week, uh, was conceived by the Kyiv Biennial and uh, Biennale Warsaw from the East Europe Biennial Alliance, and is being conducted within the framework of the second edition of the Warsaw Biennial which is now taking place uh, these days till mid uh, July. And I would like also to thank to the whole Warsaw Biennial team and especially to its director, Pavel Wojcinski for a very, very fruitful cooperation. And it's basically uh, this Armed Democracy series is uh, the, first, uh, the first one organized um, by the East Europe Biennial Alliance uh, it will be followed by other events discussing Russia's military intervention of uh, Ukraine and uh, next events after this series um, will be conducted at the uh, Biennale Matter of Art in Prague. Then also within Documenta 15 in Kassel, thanks to Of Biennale Budapest, and also at the Survival Kid Festival in Riga over the summer and fall uh, of uh, 2022. And uh, this special program was born and conceived uh, out of uh, unthinkable urgency, of course, uh, when after the, uh, February 24th, um, the Russian state, uh, which uh, took uh, the form of an openly fascist military dictatorship, put Ukrainian people under mass physical and political extermination. And uh, this uh, urgency, I have to highlight this, is very much determined by a fact, uh, which is very obvious one, but somehow from uh, my experience of the next, of the recent months, um, uh, perhaps it's so much obvious that there is a kind of a tendency to uh, somehow omit this fact in the discussions on the respective matters in the international public sphere which is about the specificity of, uh, of this war. Because unlike uh, most of uh, recent warfare conflicts of the last decades, this, this war is not just between countries. This war is not just between two armies. And it's even not only uh, the, about the war between the army and the insurgency. This war is uh, basically uh, the war 
uh, of one country's military against the other country's population, people, which are deprived of uh, simple right to exist by the aggressor. And that is indeed unprecedented and unseen for decades since uh, the end of the Second World War. Uh, so, so throughout this program, uh, during the next week or so, uh, we will be discussing different concepts um, uh, about imperialism, liberation, fascism, democracy, autocracy, militarism, and revolution, uh, and their current uh, political uh, applications. But what uh, what is also what makes this uh, program kind of special? is that we, are we will be trying to broaden our perspective and to impose it on the whole region of uh, the east of Europe, because it's at the moment it's not only Ukraine, but uh, the whole Eastern Europe uh, is getting uh, a new agency, a new subjectivity, especially in comparison and with respect to the Western Europe and in general the current Western political stance as such. Uh, and also using this opportunity, um, uh, I would like to bring to the highlight uh, the emergency support initiative that the Kyiv Biennial launched uh, actually uh, in the first days of this full-scale invasion. Uh, and uh, since then, we have been supporting uh, artists, uh, curators, cultural workers, and uh, many, many other people from the cultural, educational, and other social fields. Uh, also supporting a bunch of uh, emergency art residencies, which are now taking place in the West of uh, our country. So I would like to ask our uh, viewers and our audience to check out our um, social media accounts and would be thankful for spreading the word about this uh, very important initiative. And um, also one technical note I have to make here is that this event is uh, live streamed on uh, the Warsaw Biennial Facebook uh, page and also YouTube channel. Uh, and I would like to ask our viewers and listeners uh, uh, to leave uh, your questions and comments uh, on, on the respective Facebook page and uh, after the presentations that are planned today, we will have a round of Q&A. So I will try to voice uh, all important questions to our speak speakers afterwards. So without further ado, I am really very, very happy to introduce um, uh, our long-standing partners and my dear colleagues uh, and well-known uh, Ukrainian journalists and reporters, uh, Natalia Humenyuk and Angelina Karyakina who are uh, also together running um, the Public Interest uh, Journalism Lab, uh, a newly appeared uh, established Ukrainian media organization and the kind of an interdisciplinary coalition which uh, unites uh, journalists as well as different researchers and sociologists and uh, promotes uh, discussions and reporting on really very complex social topics and since the start of this full-scale assault on Ukraine uh, its uh, journalists and reporters uh, have been always pretty often on the front lines and um, Natalia Humenyuk uh, is a well-known uh, Ukrainian journalist and she's an author of uh, two books the Lost Island Tales from the Occupied Crimea and Maidan Tahrir. And uh, since the start of this uh, full-scale invasion, uh, she has regularly written for The Guardian, uh, The Washington Post, The Rolling Stones, Gitzeit, uh, and she also provides commentaries for CNN, MS MSNBC, Sky News, etc. She was also for quite some time a uh, director of uh, the independent Hromatsky TV and Hromatsky International TV uh, channel. And she is also a member of the Council for Freedom of Speech under the President of Ukraine, as well as the Independent Media Council. And another speaker of tonight is Angelina Karyakina, who is a journalist and media manager. 
She covered uh, Ukrainian political and social affairs, uh, Maidan protests, uh, Russian aggression and conflict in Eastern Ukraine during the last eight years. She was also an editor in chief of Hromadske TV for three years since uh, from 2017 till 2020. And she covered also trials against Ukrainian political prisoners in Russia, refugee crisis in Europe, and uh, co authored investigations about events at Maidan and received uh, a prize for investigative uh, uh, journalism. And both of them are uh, co founders of this public interest journalism, uh, uh, journalism lab, which uh, is also a partner of the project that we are going to talk uh, about and to present to our audience today, which is titled The Reckoning Project Ukraine Testifies. Uh, and uh, this is a really uh, for, for the post Soviet space and in general in the Eastern Europe, it's an unprecedented uh, endeavor because it's got a mandate to investigate human rights violations and abuses uh, since the beginning of this uh, uh, war. So the project actually collects and amplifies the testimonies of witnesses and victims of uh, Russian aggression and is also intended to build summaries into cases in order to present them to international and uh, as well as national courts. So I'm again very, very happy that uh, you managed to join us today. So now I pass on the microphone to you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much again. Thank you. It was quite a lengthy introduction, but I think we, we would tell a lot of new things to, to all of you. Um, and I probably would first uh, really describe what we are doing and what actually is done in Ukraine today and what's, you know, the Ukrainians and Ukrainian journalists and human rights defenders are capable to do. So uh, there is no, um, you know, I think the, the, we would talk later about the scale of the, you know, the crimes which are taking place in Ukraine, as you rightfully mentioned. Uh, we speak about, you know, an incredible scale, a large country and uh, the second biggest army in the world is trying to destroy the whole population of that country. Uh, and I'm speaking that like full, with full confidence. And up till this moment, the, the U Ukrainian prosecutor office speaks about possibly 20,000 so of there were crimes. There are a lot of human rights organizations working on that. Uh, the also, <clears throat> for instance, my colleague from the Civic Liberty, uh, the Center for the Civic Liberties, just they independently verify up to 7,000 cases. So that's something about the scale. However, what um, we are doing, um, it's, and I think that the world still don't fully understand that it's ongoing now. And we're speaking about all kinds of the war crimes and crimes, uh, possible crimes against humanity and attempt of genocide. Um, but um, we, the project we joined in the Public Interest Journalist Lab was uh, elaborated in the early stage of war with two other people, Peter Pomeranzo, with whom we worked very closely for the last years, who is the uh, co-founder of the um, ARENA program at the John Hopkins, uh, you know, the, 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 the writer, the researcher, and also quite a new person to Ukraine, but uh, absolutely known globally. Uh, her name is Janine Di Giovanni, a legendary war correspondent who spent 20 20, uh, th almost uh, more than 30 years reporting on all, all, all kind of the pro uh, conflicts, you know, uh, reporting four genocides. Uh, we're speaking about the Srebrenica, about Rwanda, uh, Syria, but also, you know, Yazidis. And uh, she also, you know, was reporting the Chechnya and uh, spent a lot of years, many, many, many years in the Middle East. Uh, but what we also understood in the early stage, um, when we were super busy, of course, with our own reporting, that uh, it's true that the crimes are repetitive, but in this particular case, they are repeated by the very same people. Uh, that if you speak about the Chechnya and, um, and Syria and Ukraine, they're the very same generals, the very same people, and the pattern is very the same. And very important is to connect these dots and to tell the story. Also, another um, story is that because of the, um, the historically, 
there were different times. The media worked differently. So uh, usually the, uh, you know, it taken some time. There was some lag behind the, what journalists did and later when the human rights organizations were coming. Um, so there were years between the, uh, re uh, the recording of the testimonies of the people in Srebrenica and what had happened. Of course, Syria is very difficult terrain, extremely difficult terrain, as we know, because but there is an authoritarian regime, a very ruthless, uh, with all the support from Russia. Uh, there are almost no international reporters working on the ground. So even if the cases were, you know, recorded in the early stage of the war or later, often there are very, you know, it, it takes time. Um, you really need to find the way how to do that. In Ukraine, there is something unique globally happening. All uh, I think that the, the, the Russia, uh, the Russian regime. Uh, totally, uh, because it was unpunished, because there was such a long impunity for everything they did, but also because those crimes were taking place in particular countries, which often were uh, were authoritarian, like Syria, or let's say uh, when we speak about the Chechnya, uh, you know, we knew what was happening there, but it's still considered to be that there is a sovereignty of Russia. You know, I mean, it, it just one place in Russia. You know, each asset is still in power. And I think that they totally underestimated that Ukraine is a democratic state uh, with a capable government, with a capable uh, law enforcement, and also, you know, I mean, and capable to extend because none of the law enforcement globally in any country in the world would be capable to do what what what, what we are doing, what Ukrainians should do. But uh, there is an unprecedented excess to, um, you know, to the crime scene. The whole country is the crime scene. All the international organization can work here. All the Ukrainians organization can work here. Ukrainian media, international media. But Russian still didn't hide much. We can discuss later Mariupol, you know, which is under the occupation. But really they don't hide. They do things. And this impunity created the, the case where they commit crimes of the incredible scale without really thinking that somebody may track. Because for years, you know, they really were not punished. And this is a, 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 an incredible opportunity, first of all, for those people, for, for, for everybody, for, for, for Georgia, for Moldova, for Libya, for any country where those crimes were committed by the same people to wait for justice for those, for, to, to, to ask for the justice. So basically what we do, what I also understood that, um, and I have this kind of team, in interesting division in the team, we've been joined also by the international reporters and journalists, they usually think like, you know, we do the job, it doesn't have impact because it's up to lawyers to record those stories. But I also talk to the lawyers, a very, you know, the, the very, uh, um, in, incredibly famous, you know, different lawyers which uh, worked in different war crimes globally. Um, they tell us and tell me in particular when we started to talk that, you know, the story can't be told without a proper narrative. You know, even like if we make the case, if the story isn't told, that would be denial. That would be the, uh, you know, the public won't trust. So somehow it seems like both media and both legal, you know, like human rights lawyers and the others feel that something isn't working for them. And our idea is both to collect the testimonies of the people who investigated, who, who experienced crimes in probably limited number, but also make a story, like a grand narrative, which would uh, let us not to deny what happened in Ukraine after the years, that there would be films, there would be, uh, you know, projects, multimedia projects, and they would tell this grand, great, great story of, of the country and of the countries and of the societies. Um, so it would last for years, of course. Also from our side, um, we gathered also a lot of people, uh, you know, like the journalists from Kharkiv, Kherson, Kahovka, all the places in Ukraine, uh, who, you know, who are, of course, for who, for who are the members of their societies, and we're talking. But something to tell um, before, my, my, before Angelina joins. Uh, first of all, it's really about the scale. Give an example. Sometimes I, I told about 20 thousands. But when I talk to the head of the police of the Kiev region, Andriy uh, Nebatov, at that moment, there were around 3,000 cases in the Kiev region. And what he told was quite appalling, that almost half of those cases, the people were executed. They were shot. It, it, I mean, mainly men, but also, you know, women and kids, but mainly men. 
Still, when we hear the figure of 3000, we think like, you know, it's shelling. You know, you shell, you kill, you know, 50 people with one rocket. You know, it's deliberate, it's, it's somewhere, you know, it's maybe not the targeted. But when you imagine that 1,500 people were shot in Kyiv region, that's really something different. That's really something. And I do know later, and something I want to, to tell more, you know, we working, we, we now refocused a lot on what's going on in the, um, you know, Kherson, Zaporizhia region, mainly occupied parts. It's ongoing. The Bucha is ongoing there. Because even though there is no access now, we can talk to the people. And even if we can to go to some of the liberated areas, there would be one village where there would be the Russians uh, staying for one week. And I would say there would be a man tortured there. And also what's important that, you know, wherever we go to any village which was under the occupation, some people would say like, nothing horrible happened here. Just one person killed. But I, I, it's happening almost everywhere. When we went to Chernihy, what I was appalled, well, I was appalled by that, that in three villages, just going with the first trip, field trip, you know, some kind of just knowing the terrain. We've been to the three villages and randomly, I met three men, three men, with whom I started to talk, just like, you know, what's happening in your village? What is in the streets? It's destroyed. And just randomly, the guy would say, like, my son was killed. And another guy would say, well, my son was killed. You know, it's pure randomness. But, you know, this randomness for me shows the scale. But something uh, else to add. I think that we, today, uh, some of the international reporters told me that they are cautious about the... Uh, they, they didn't understand scale, so I think it's our first task to explain that today at this moment. Second, uh, people are concerned about the terms war crimes, crimes against humanity, and we know that the genocide is extremely loaded term, extremely, and it was misused by, 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 by dictators. And when we started the project, our international lawyers who also worked in Syria were very cautious, like, you know, don't tell this is a war crime. You know, we used all these words, alleged, you know, it says. But wherever I present just a basic mapping, even not without starting, even without starting, you know, like just say, they saying what we've done just to identify what's happening in the region. We were from the beginning say, understand that like, look, it's definitely not just war crimes because the war crimes could be committed by, you know, like a particular platoon. But if some case of, um, you know, using the people as a human shield or killing the head of the community happens in three regions, it couldn't be misconduct. Because misconduct, it's when one, you know, rotten apple or one platoon misbehave because maybe this platoon is crazy. Maybe the boss of this platoon, the officer is kind of, uh, a, a, you know, a, a crazy person or just sadistic and, and it's his guilt. But when you see the things happening in Bucha and in Chernihiv and in the village of um, um, Kharkiv and Kherson, even without that, we know it, it's, it's, it's systematic. It's the scale is already enough. So I'm very sure and confident to speak about the crimes against humanity, not about war crimes, and also about the attempt of genocide. We would be cautious, but the more we talk about that, an attempt is there because we would discuss more, you know, like, like anybody who is not openly supporting Russia in the occupied territories is under attack. You don't need to be an activist. You just don't need to be open support. Then you are under threat. And my final uh, thing is to say that um, wherever I talk internationally, I would say that there is some call saying like, we don't know yet. We don't know enough. Maybe we need to wait till another amnesty or human rights watch or any other organization would file their report. And I would say this is intellectual laziness an excuse for inaction, nothing else. Because it's very weird to say we don't know. I meet too often people who say, oh, we don't know. I think it's written. The Western media do incredible job. There are already enough of the reports of the full four months. So I think that the very important to say that this idea that justice takes time often is misused as an excuse of inaction. Because my case I talked to my colleague, uh, also Lesa Matvichuk, who is a famous Ukrainian human rights defender. And she said, like, we don't want to be memorial. 
We don't want to become, make a museum. We actually want to prevent what's happening now. So I do think it's something very important for us. We're doing our projects. We're doing narration. It's long term. But I cannot like operating. with. And I know that my international partners who are coming to Ukraine because they've been to a lot of places saying like, um, it take time. You need to kind of, you know, you know, spread, you know, your, your energy and resources. It takes time. But I'm impatient because I think there are things we can predict at the same time, and we should think differently. Um, with that, I'll pass the word to Angelina, who speak also about the field work, but also about our concerns, how the scale of what's happening can also uh, a bit under undermine the um, value of any story. You know, like if there are too many horrible stories, does it mean that the smaller stories, the story of just a murder, just a murder, does it mean it doesn't matter if we have those thousands of them? Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Vasil. Uh, I will probably start with, with, with this specific uh, thought Natalia just uh, uh, articulated. Um, we have been working for more than four months and uh, be specifically because of the scale uh, of the crimes, we can now as journalists see, well, that's, you know, that's a story of a local murder and torture number, I don't know, 200, yes? Whether we should go as media for it again. Um, the problem is that uh, it's a conscious decision which, which you take um, to cover all of those stories and, and to work with them systematically. And I need to tell you that uh, the, the infamous fatigue, the war fatigue and the compassion fatigue, it does come. It, comes not only with uh, it it comes not only among the the foreign media but among ukrainian media itself and it's a huge editorial dilemma how we how we deal with it and how we keep on working with that on one hand that is the problem on the other hand a part of the country is unreachable for us that is the occupied uh, the occupied regions the occupied uh, temporarily occupied cities for example the city of mariupol which is the city which is the cemetery itself. And um, from what we know, uh, you know, just very fragmentarily from some videos on YouTube, user generated content, from some also propagandistic videos um, you know, produced by, by Russia and, and Russian proxies, is that what Russia is doing there is, is, is just eliminating all, uh, all the traces of of, of the horrible things that took place uh, took place in Mariupol, apart from the fact that uh, a term called filtration came in uh, action in reality, and that's a word that many people many people from Mariupol use. You know, like go to a shop, go through filtration. Well, my uncle couldn't join us in Lithuania because he was going through filtration. Well, my my mom couldn't, you know, come to couldn't get out of the city because she was still going through filtration. Just let me quickly uh, explain to, to our audience that filtration, uh, I mean, we, we are, we know this term from probably the, the Second World War. Uh, it is, it, it really means the same. What Russians are doing is just uh, sometimes closing down people. So checking people, uh, whether they have anything to do with the Ukrainian government, with the Ukrainian army, with the Ukrainian journalists, with the Ukrainian activists, be it, you know, ecology or anti-corruption or just you name it. It, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't really you know, matter what. And the fact that it is a Ukrainian city and people who are you know, going through this filtration, many of them have lots of what to do you know with the ukrainian government and ukrainian army it was a city uh, on basically in in the middle of the bat battleground yes uh, just uh, very close to the front line so many people were somehow uh, connected to the army if not serving there preparing food you know working as postmen things like that uh, it was a city that was uh, undergoing uh, lots of changes and lots of reforms. So many people were, you know, engaged in many things. And uh, what the Russians are doing is just basically um, taking those who have anything to do with, with Ukraine, 
uh, and take them to the prisons, to the so-called DPR, to, to the temporarily occupied territories in Donetsk, and keep them there. Uh, some people are lost. Uh, some families are torn apart. We have just today uh, talked uh, uh, to Natalia. She told me a story which my colleague is um, is investigating. Uh, it's one of the stories that actually, you know, we, we know there are many of them of the families torn apart. Where, for, for example, one parent would be undergoing this filtration or just basically captured. And uh, the kids will, would be taken to Russia uh, for a later adoption or just for, you know, staying somewhere in social services. And uh, this is like, this is kind of a crime. We, frankly speaking, we have never faced. I mean, I myself as a Ukrainian journalist, I have never covered wars as much. I mean, apart from from the war in Ukraine since 2014, but this is something unspeakable. I mean, covering covering uh, filtration and covering, you know, taking kids from their from their parents and uh, forcing them to stay in, in in Russian institutions. It's just something that we will be probably describing as um, as very very special. Uh, apart from that. Um, Mariupol, you know, as a scene of crime itself is, is being changed very dramatically and there is no way for us to somehow, well, first of all, get the access there. The network is really bad there. People are afraid, even those who would like to share some information, they physically have no chance to, to speak to their relatives, to, to, to journalists. Um, that is one thing. The other is that uh, they quickly, I mean, the, the Russians, they quickly turn the places and the sites of mass murder, basically, uh, into something, in, into ordinary, you know, operating institutions. Like they, for example, um, there was a, uh, there was an announcement in Mariupol that the dramatic theater where several hundred people were killed by an uh, aviation bomb will be soon reopened in, in autumn, in, in, in the fall. Uh, you know, this, um, this narrative that Mariupol will be rebuilt, that it's a, um, it will become a blossoming city, things like that. Um, apart from the fact that it is so cynical, it's just we understand that so many um, crime scenes and so many traces of crimes will be just lost uh, for, for, for a long time. And uh, for us as journalists, getting back to the question, how do we do this uh, reporting without having an opportunity to do the field reporting? Um, we, we, we get in touch with the people in any possible way. For example, there are lots of lots of telegram channels where people share their stories. And some of them, especially in Mariupol, they're just unspeakably sad and tragic. For example, there is a, a, a telegram channel about the people who were lost or killed in Mariupol. There are uh, several dozens, thousands of people, subscribers in this, in this telegram channel. And what they do is they send pictures of their loved ones and a small text saying, you know, describing the circumstances under which they uh, saw each other for the last time, or for example, asking, you know, there is a house number 25 on the street. There was, a, you know, a, a lady on the fifth floor. Could you go and check? And someone would reply, there are no houses on the street anymore. So, you know, the lady you're asking about is, is, is gone. And of course, it, it's hard for us to verify this, this information. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we have not much to work with, but, but, just, but just with that. Uh, as to the witnesses of, of the horrible things that took place in Mariupol, it's also important to understand that some of these people left, be it, be it Russia, for different reasons. Also for a reason, because the, the, there was almost no way for them to leave through Ukraine. The people wouldn't be just let out. Um, but also just to uh, get away from war to escape and many people left and they are right now in Europe. We need to understand that these people, I don't want to compare the scale of, of the horrible things that took place in Kiev, Oblast, you know, in Kharkiv, in Sumy, in Chernihiv, in Mariupol, but Mariupol is something really, really special. And these people um, who are dealing with their trauma right now, who are telling their stories, 
it's something that uh, I don't know. We still all need to, to deal with. For example, several people whom I spoke to, uh, they uh, walked from Mariupol uh, on their feet. They they walked out of the city for a week or so, you know, with their pets, with their kids, uh, just uh, staying overnight uh, in streets, uh, and, and it's. It's, it's, it's completely unimaginable, but th this is what we're dealing with. Uh, let me also quickly get to the point, uh, you know, we very frequently we hear from some um, foreigners, from some colleagues or experts or analytics saying that um, if, you know, why would Ukraine fight so fiercely, for example, for Mariupol? letting all those people get killed because you know it's, it's 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 a fire it's a burning fire and people get killed why wouldn't ukraine just withdraw and then at least save the civilian lives uh this is a very confusing argument because right after bucha was you know revealed as a fact right after the day we entered bucha and we as journalists reporters could see all the horrible things there with our own eyes could see the bodies could see the bodies with the hands uh, tied behind their uh, back uh, people for example from occupied kherson were calling us and saying oh my god they're going to do the same in kherson so occupation is is death and torture occupation in in this case is not a way out. It's, it's not a way to save people's lives. It's it's the opposite, and it's a very important thing for, I think, for many for many of our colleagues and for many people who are really interested interested in Ukraine to understand. Because we, well, being realistic, let's face it: when the heating season will come, when the gas bills in Germany will arrive, there will be talks again about peace in Ukraine sitting down and negotiating some successions or, you know, uh, something, uh, I don't know, senseful for the world, but completely, probably horrible for Ukraine. Uh, the, the argument is that, you know, as soon as Ukraine withdraws, these territories and, and these territories are being occupied by absolutely barbaric and brutal uh, forces where people are get tortured, killed, captured, filtrated, uh, sent to, to Russia just randomly. Uh, and it's something that, that the world needs, needs to consider uh, while having these discussions about how peace in Ukraine um, should look like. Um, actually, one probably uh, point about occupation that I, I wanted to add, uh, Many people in the occupation don't really understand how to behave. And it's something that we also do not really cover probably internally and, you know, in the world where, for example, uh, parents of my, my colleague and friend uh, ask her whether going to work, they, you know, they work in some institutions um, and receiving their pension and receiving their salaries would mean collaboration. And they, they don't really know what to do uh, because they, they really hope it is temporary. temporary. They wait for the armed forces to, um, to, uh, um, to come in these in these occupied uh, villages and towns. But uh, the feeling of uh, complete, you know, be being lost uh, there uh, and in the face uh, of this uh, horrible army also makes people worry about even you know vital things like going to work and getting getting their uh, legal money you know uh, buying food from shops if if this food is russian people do really care about it or for example when um the uh, grivnia uh, turnaround is is uh, is stopped whether it's a, 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 an act of collaboration to use use the rubbles. So many people really care about it, and they ask each other. You know, of, of course, it's a question to our government, uh, to the Ukrainian government. How do we communicate with the people in occupied territories? What do we, we tell them and explain them? But it's 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 a huge concern and it's a huge uh, huge uh, thing. So pe people in occupation, they, they don't really know what to do. They don't understand for how long this, the, 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 this whole mess is there. Um, 
And uh, probably f f my final point uh, is for all of us, uh, I mean, it's obvious to many Ukrainians um, to realize that this war is for a long time because it's not a war for territories or resources. If it was for territories and resources, at least you could understand the final point of this war. Uh, for, many, uh, for many of countries and, and, and foreigners, there's a question, okay, so maybe they will take Donbass and then just uh, everything will calm down. No, we understand that as soon as they take Donbass, they will then move forward to Kharkiv, to Zaporizhia, to Odessa, and Mikolaev, and uh, you know, uh, how what is, what is the other way to understand demilitarization and den denazification? So it's important to understand that this war is here for a long time, and the implications of this war and consequences of this war are not only about Ukraine, as, as this war is not only about Ukraine, it's about the whole world. And uh, as I already pointed out, the gas bills in, in, in Germany which for sure will become a huge discussion in Germany and a dis discussion about, and we know that the Russian narrative would be to blame Ukraine for it. Uh, but um, again, it's a question to, uh, to the German civil society, the question of political responsibility, you know, for doing business with rogue regimes um, and for the pay, you know, and for the price that uh, the European uh, societies are paying for this war, because in the case of Ukraine, it's people's lives. In some other case, it might be, you know, a gas bill, something like that. So it's also an, a, a huge ethical question: who is ready, who is ready for what for for, for what price? Yes, to, to pay uh, during this war. It's also talking about implications. It's also important to understand that, uh, and we, we've been talking about it. And there's a great lecture of uh, Professor Timothy Snyder about it. It's the famine and the, the food crisis that is coming. And um, the idea that the whole world is, is, uh, will become uh, uh, the victim uh, of this war, uh, making uh, the biggest victims out of most vulnerable countries and societies uh, in, in the so-called global south. Um, it is also an important thing for us uh, when we ask each other, how do we cover this war? Where do we focus? You know, what is the context to this war? Do we understand what it is really about? Is it really, you know, about U Russia, Ukraine, history, or whatever? Uh, yeah, I will probably I will probably stop here. Uh, that's that's very briefly about our uh, about our <laughs> work. <laughs> it was about ideas about what the West should do rather than <laughs> that I should I cannot say. help myself but also um, yeah I feel like you use voice this it, option yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah definitely we have to use any options available uh, for for that matter of course so thanks so much for these insightful inputs I would just uh, really um, would like to ask uh, a couple of questions here just uh, for um, for some clarifications because I'm Somehow I'm also in this position, you know, like uh, struggling myself institutionally and personally, how to proceed uh, amidst this uh, ongoing catastrophe. But um, to both of you, basically, I think that this point about the scale and that uh, this, the very fact that this is constantly ongoing and will be ongoing on and on, unfortunately, in the nearest future, at least, uh, and of course, like what you, Natalia, mentioned about the people who were like literally shot, uh, not just uh, killed by an airstrike and so on. It, of course, uh, like uh, the, this concept of genocide and so on are super loaded, of course, and uh, bear, bear lots of um, historical uh, burden. But at the same time, if you use it as a kind of an attempt, it, of course, reminds very much this kind of uh, genocide by bullets, right? Uh, so it somehow we, we see this kind of strange, uh, also historical similarity, though I'm not drawing pa any parallels here. But uh, I'm really curious, um, because I suppose that uh, like at least some part of our audience is perhaps uh, those representatives of uh, different uh, organizations and uh, like initiatives in the so-called civic society realm, right? So we can discuss a lot like what also Helena uh, like suggested, like what are the political matters to be addressed directly on a 
kind of uh, professional political level or the geopolitical perhaps level and so on. But also I'm wondering whether as you are so much deeply rooted in all these uh, developments and like directly reporting from the field, maybe you would uh, kind of, it's of, co of course not about some recipes, right? But maybe you can suggest or, or point out or hint at something what what is missing currently internationally right in the what can be done or highlighted in the civic realm in order to since the scale is still ongoing and it will be ongoing in order to prevent it as much as possible so maybe there are some ideas which are already somehow obvious to you to the organization that you represent but uh, somehow are not totally that international audience are not totally aware of it you know, that maybe you can hint at some possible routes or uh, moduses how to approach things in order to change this. I think we can debate about the term fascist and a lot of people would. But I have this debate with people I know uh, regarding whether if Russia, if Putin has this opportunistic ideology, you know, because I think that his ideology is opportunistic. It cannot be described as easily as ISIS or even as uh, what Nazis did. But it doesn't mean that what he does isn't. So I think very important, it's to not to theorize, but just really judge by what is done. And from that, we simply go to the idea that, for instance, Angelina talked uh, in details about the occupation, that the occupation is morally unacceptable. We cannot agree that, for instance, Mosul would stay under ISIS and that's okay. That's so, you know, because I think it's morally unacceptable for anybody to say that, okay, uh, for me, this analogy, you know, covering the Middle East is really there because, you know, as somebody who is infidel for the word of the, the, the uh, fundamentalist uh, could be under threat, you shouldn't be like, you know, uh, an open, um, in, in open the position, but if you just probably would be suspected non-believer. You might be, you might be um, killed or executed. That's how I feel being this unbeliever to the Russian, to the Ruski Mir in some way, wherever it means, doesn't matter what, those people don't know. Uh, so I think that's very, very, very critical. Uh, the second is, I think that um, we also talk about the powerlessness, which often comes with this, uh, you know, uh, empathy fatigue. And it's true, I feel powerless about Syria. I feel powerless about Yemen and a lot of other places. And I don't think that we are, because sometimes people are speaking about these competitions of the, you know, who is the bigger victim. I totally uh, say like, I'm out of that. Solidarity is not something, it's not like a fossil fuel. You know, it can be enough for everybody. It can be enough. Um, but what is different that it's about the legitimacy of the call. People couldn't come to Chechnya or help Chechens because yes, they were rebels in the Russian state. So there were all this discussion about the sovereignty, you know, whether the West can arm uh, the, the Syrian fighters because they are members of the position of a sovereign country. In case of Ukraine, Ukraine is a pluralistic democratic country with elected government, elected parliament, which is, you know, a position is in the parliament and they are voting with a pluralistic press. So if every person in Ukrainian society today gives an idea that we can, uh, you know, stop it by, uh, by particular, you know, having some arms, it's a very morally legit idea. So I do think for the intellectuals, which for me as well, somebody who for years participated, and I still strongly believe in the, you know, reconciliation, I'm actually still, you know, would say that the, I, I was not the big critics of the Minsk agreement, you know, as agreement as such, it, it, it didn't work because there was those who didn't want to use it. Uh, but in the end, at this particular stage of war, there is an idea to, to kill Ukrainians and you can stop it. So of course, weapon is there to stop the murderers and engaging into discussion that there should be something else, then we should globally challenge the idea of the army as such. What the hell, how it happened that every single country in the world has an army, why we have them? So if, if, if we have some doubts, you know, if, if we have some doubts about the, 
whether the the world could spend you know support Ukraine in this support then we should have doubts why our countries have armies but if we agree in the ideas that armies are legit if they are legit if they act accordingly with the sovereignty within of the state then all those doubts which I, I think like a gun and then of course we're coming back with the idea of the responsibility of protect which is also a loaded term but in this regard it's call this call is coming for from a very solid democratic pluralistic society with you know like incredible legitimacy so i do think these calls and shaping this discussion about the moral and acceptance uh, of, you know, uh, uh, as idea of the motives of the people at the modern time should be there and kind of an inner acceptance that we can call with all the legitimacy, you know, like really, I, not, not not really liking the analogy, but, you know, like we're still working, we, we, we do live okay uh, intellectually with the armies, uh, you know, like with the fact that there was a French, you know, there was a Charles de Gaulle, you know, joining the, 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 the fight against Vichy regime. That's okay in our mental map. I do think that the concept of the, you know, legit war has been misused for the last 70 years, often. In many lot of places, um, so many uh, so many countries uh, and regimes use it. But yes, we went back to this point uh, mainly because also the Putin lives this way. <laughs> you know, weirdly, he wants to recall that that times, so he acts in the very similar way. What is in his mind? So that would be my uh, my main um, you know call. Um, with those civil society, wherever they help. You know, I had this dilemma with, uh, for eight years covering the war, that every single mother usually don't want her kids to fight. And I, it's painful to see the mothers who really say, wherever I go in different places, that they do understand that it's their son's duty is to be there. They cannot stop them. They feel it's right. That's painful but they know it's right. And in that regard, I would trust them fully. I have probably a, a simpler <laughs> and a shorter call, uh, a professional one as a journalist. Uh, we understand that, uh, again, with, with these attention spans, uh, the media will be leaving Ukraine or come just for the breaking news, you know, come quickly for the Kremenchuk shelling or for Odessa shelling or whatever happens next. Uh, what what we need is sustainable coverage of Ukraine, and uh, we 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 know that the majority of global media having their head offices in Moscow used to cover Ukraine as a region from Moscow, and uh, now under these tragic circumstances, many media start to reconsider how they have been covering Ukraine so far and whether they should need uh, to open. Their, their, their office in Ukraine. Some, some of, some of them do really. Uh, we, we understand that. That's also the reason uh, is, is, is also that many, uh, many media, many foreign media were kicked out of Russia, and that's that, that's also uh, that's also a thing to consider. But uh, again, that's a question to to the media. How can the war be uh, covered? Uh, by not being on the ground, being on the ground is the only is the only way for a proper coverage. And being here on the ground, you can really see and understand that Ukraine is not only about war. It's a fully functioning state with an incredibly interesting horizontal society, with decentralized decentralized democracy, with very interesting interactions between communities, central authorities, local authorities, regional authorities. Uh, with functioning factories, hospitals, even schools. Um, it's, it, it's, it's many, many things that are actually, as Natalia pointed out, operating, functioning in Ukraine. And for many democracies in crisis, Ukraine could be this, you know, fresh air as a, as a thing that really works, even at the times of war, or tragically so, but maybe better at the times of war because of the huge con uh, consolidation and mobilization and solidarity. So um, it's, it's a question of coverage, of sustainable coverage, of presence, 
uh, being here and uh, working, seeing, talking to people whom, whom you cover and uh, just understanding them. Yeah, in this regard, just to pick up where you just finished, uh, I'm really curious because you and Helena also, but there's question also to both of you perhaps, uh, this uh, issue of uh, war fatigue, right? And I'm also wondering because uh, somehow what I'm observing uh, among my colleagues, especially in the West, uh, this is exactly something that we all face, right? I mean, in that or another manner. But uh, how do you tackle this issue as journalists? Because I mean, after this uh, very first initial shock and uh, uh, the, when the war began, when the full-scale invasion began, of course, and after these atrocities like in the key region and elsewhere. So of course there were so much uh, huge attention like uh, focused on Ukraine. But this, this question is not only just about how to keep this global attention, right? Like uh, it's not a, a purpose in itself, but at the same time, it seems like that uh, this war after the four months of its development is just a kind of a trespasses into the zone of just like another war in the global media that you sometimes uh, uh, pay attention to, right? Like, yeah, how do you tackle in, yeah, in a professional I, I, sense? I think, you know, like I'm quite irritating with the question about the war fatigue uh, because there is no any other way to describe it than laziness, nothing but laziness. Because the only way, first of all, just to say that we are not here in the entertainment. Ukraine is not there to entertain the world. It was just too easy for the first uh, months uh, that you really can just go somewhere, be in Kiev, and it's interesting. You know, like really, like you do nothing and you're called by the best reporter in the globe to be live. Um, and I think quite too many people enjoy that and thought that they can do nothing. And it will st still uh, be on the front pages. So uh, that would be my, my first answer. That really, it's it's again for me an excuse. And of course, if you really speak about the journalism, what our organization, the Public Interest Journalism Lab, doing, we always claim that journalism is a service. It's for public good. It's also like the difficult pill, you know, like uh, um, you know when you, you you need to have it when you have you, when society is sick. You need to have this conversation. So indeed, it's not really entertainment. The German journalism is a, so if it's not entertaining, it doesn't mean we don't need to consume because people go for other things which maybe are not pleasant, but they are helpful. They do sport. I hate sport. I really hate it. But like, I really do it because it's helpful, you know, because it's healthy. So I do think there is something, the analogy should be there, that some things you need to work out. You go to study, you, you learn about some things. Uh, and the, 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 I really despise really, really strongly despise the idea as, as a news and the part of the entertainment. I really think that, that there is a great, great responsibility for those who put uh, journalism into the idea of entertainment. So I think that is the first. Um, the second is, you know, I, I would be the, the wrong person to answer because I'm consider myself a person who is a war correspondent, meaning like I do something opposite. I'm interested in the war, but not because I hate the horrible things. I think these extreme moments, they show the people in their best. They show, they, they sh give some moments when you see that humans are, you know, they aspire for the best good in them. I don't know what's wrong with me. I cannot hate within this war. You know, like I just cannot hate. I'm dis I think I am not able to hate. Um, but the point that, that I'm fascinated I'm inspired because wherever I go, I talk to the lady who is, whose husband was tortured and I have never seen the more horrible pictures of the way how tortured he was, he was killed. But her resilience and her determination and her dignity and the way he be, she behaves is such an inspiration that you really think like, I don't understand how those people in that poor village, that lady can kind of have this amount of dignity, how I cannot admire that. Uh, we talked recently with Angelina on that. We, we're talking about, you know, whether we can cover the war constructively. And I do think this, you cannot be, you cannot feel fatigue from inspiration. There is no way for that. And I do think it's not really about the topics, it's about the optics and about the approach. 
it's not about ticking the box and do kind of the horrible story about the rape or something, something, because I've been to a couple of the trips with the quite a great reporters, I would say like renowned. And I don't say I'm better, but I'm just was amused. How come that we come to the same place and they see this blah, 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 you know, like this boom, boom, boom kind of fight and the, 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 their report is so grim. While in my case, there would be this incredible lady in this town who just would say how she dreams about the green meadows, which would come back in two months and how she see her city would rebuild and how beautiful her very ugly city, I don't like it, but how kind of she appreciate this city and how kind of poetically she described the flowers she would like to grow in her yard when the spring would ha come and uh, we would, you, you know, and what she aspires for. So I do think that this is something where, mm, you know, we, we have the way. We just should should really look at this, you know, uh, because I'm concerned. I know that with the time, you know, there is some limit to that and people behave, they are becoming more ruthless, they become more angry, uh, they become, that, that's how trauma works. That's how trauma works, that we kind of stop to see the best. But this highest good of the humans couldn't be seen more. And I, 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 I can't imagine that there is way to, to you know, and, and I think that Europe became very cynical. The globe has become very cynical. We all became, you know, like kind of, it became normalized. Cynicism became normalized. Putin misused the cynicism a lot in his kind of ideology, wherever we call it. I think it's cynicism partially as a lot of autocrats. And this is our way uh, to, 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 to be, be back, you know, to allow ourselves some idealism about the people, not in, not in films, but in real life. I have nothing to add to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely, uh, I, I put my signature under each word. The only thing is that it's not that you, of course, it's, it's about the perspective, but it's out there. I mean, all those stories, with each story, I don't know how about other people, but when I see, and it's a daily report, it's daily reports about the bombed and shelled residential areas, villages and towns. In every picture, you would see a fireman or, you know, a, a guy who is helping out with, with the debris. And I don't know, I always, my attention is drawn to, to these people who are helping out, who are working, you know, who then just sit down, take a cigarette, smoke, and then go, you know, and dig out a dog, you know, or a person and, and, and do something. Of course, on, on one hand, it's, 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 it's the perspective, but on the other, I mean, it's out there. Ukraine is like that. Uh, there are, I mean, all of these stories are all around you. These incredible people with, with nothing behind their back, but still somehow raising money you know, helping each other. This is an incredible story to, to cover. And it's something that you really cannot be tired of. Yeah, thank you. And also another question from my side, which uh, I am myself uh, like uh, trying to solve in a way, <laughs> but perhaps um, unsuccessfully. But I'm also interested in your in your view on that because um, it's rather about like uh, Natalka mentioned the term uh, grand narrative, uh, but uh, this is a question also about the uh, aggressor's narrative, right? And um, what was really appalling and just uh, totally shocking for the first period of time after this uh, full scale invasion began for me was. I mean, apart from these uh, like uh, events uh, taking place on the ground, I was really, I mean, I still cannot even come to terms with that. And I think that's, this is not just our problem, actually, not only in Ukraine. I think in general, internationally, that the, the very fact that such words as denazification or filtration, which was already mentioned, or like uh, preventing genocide, like allegedly, right? I mean, from the side of the aggressor, or the modernization that they, uh, this is such an atrocity in, in itself. I mean, even on a discursive level, that for me, it was really very hard even to imagine that these words are out there in the public sphere and everybody somehow 
has to refer to them and to use them in order to like to challenge them or to tackle them. So, I mean, do you, do you have some maybe also like, you, do you have any thoughts and how, somehow your approach is how to counter this atrocity to, because this is something unbelievable and somehow for me it was shocking that at least at least it seems that the global public sphere and the political sphere professional sphere somehow accepted that these words are already there again and uh, I don't really know, maybe also the notion of fashion, that's why, why it uh, came into the framework, right, uh, here in a way, is also because how to, to counter it, but in general, what kind of approaches you use in your professional work in order to count this discourse as such, because it's even, it's a wrong way even to refer to that, but somehow unavoidably we have to do that in order to counter it. So do you have any ideas how to deal with this? I, frankly speaking, maybe I'm mistaken because I'm in my own bubble. I don't feel that this narrative is somehow, you know, winning, that people are seriously, uh, the, the world, I mean, the respected civilized world is seriously into that narrative. I frankly believe that this narrative uh, has lost and the narrative, and Ukraine is the one who is uh, building the narrative around this war, really. Because the world has, has, has seen and has witnessed also being here, because the foreign media also have done an incredible job by being here. I mean, out of eight journalists killed in the line of duty, duty five were foreign journalists. Uh, I think the Ukrainian narrative has, has won, at least at, 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 this, at this point. We, we, don't, we, we don't know uh, how it will uh, you know, work out in the end. Plus, we're not really following other parts of the world, you know, as we already mentioned, like maybe Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Russian propaganda is quite strong there, and, and, and we know it. But at the same time, I don't feel that we have to refer to these terms and speak this language like seriously. It wasn't the case in 2014, though. It was really like we really had to explain are to explain the world why we aren't really neo-Nazis or Benderites or whatever. Now, it's not really the case now. I mean, it's, it's my personal impression. Uh, I, was also th I think that where we should think about that, it's still, of course, Russia. But I think that how you come to that, people help you. You know, I, I sometimes say, like, uh, say to some of our colleagues who are coming from activism, saying like, look, 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 we are not there to... Um, you know, to imagine the idea of what people should think, we keep it, we get it from them, you know, like the people think first and we as journalists then, you know, path it to the others. So for instance, uh, when we with Angelina were in Dnipro and we're working on the story about the Jewish community there, it was them who, who presented us this term half swastika. They just said like, oh, this half swastika, that's how the Jews in Ukraine call the letter Z, and you know, like it's enough to counter if, and they do have the legitimacy to do that. So I do think that's the way to play it. And I do think it's really not, it, it's very interesting when people tell that to us. Um, yet my concern is true that unfortunately, uh, we, where the, the, where I believe the, the, the terms traveled well, uh, we, we listen. We heard that in Russia there was some research when they said that denazification is too complicated. People didn't get what is that. But I still claim that what's happening, uh, what's happening exactly um, in there, um, is a result not of the last four years. It's of the twenty years of the dehumanization as Ukrainians. And really from early to southern, you know, do you remember when this narrative about the Ukrainians Nazi appeared maybe prior to the Yanukovych elections 2003, where the Ukrainians, but I think it's it's even earlier, you know, like started, I, I think it's a long narrative coming from the, you know, they taken it from the shelf uh, of the, you know, Stalin and the others, and then they started to impose on the Russian media about the Ukrainians being Nazis and being the nationalists. And it was there, there, there for 20 years, because we know that the guys who are serving in Russia, they're often in their 18s and 19s, you know, like they're very young, uh, but, but they do believe, uh, but, but partially they believe. 
And I do believe that part of that uh, was possible because the Russian society actually, in the end, believed in this narrative. It's, it's real for them. It's not real for us, but it's real for the huge part of the society who believe that even if we are not Nazi and they do not understand what's Nazi up, somehow for them, you know, like being loyal to Ukraine, being loyal to the state, uh, that would be that would be enough. It's basically, you know, became a synonymous for a Ukrainian, you know, for the conscious Ukrainian, for the Ukrainian who don't want to assimilate and call themselves that, you know, like we are Russians. Um, so uh, we need, we cannot not, you know, in this context, we might probably need to to think that that it, it, this this term means something for the group of people who instrumentalize that and uses this term to kill the other. Right. And also uh, another point I would like to refer to, uh, Angelina mentioned uh, this, um, um, uh, the famine, which is threatening uh, basically the countries of the global uh, south. And uh, I'm also wondering uh, and wanted to ask you as journalists, um, don't you somehow think that, um, because I sometimes feel that um, we are in a kind of a vicious circle here, that basically, uh, um, like it's not just that uh, um, that the, it, the the global media attention is being redirected from Ukraine onto some other issues elsewhere, like in uh, in in Africa or Middle East and so on. But also, I think that somehow it's not just about hypocrisy or cynicism of the West, but it's rather it it, it seems like that um, it it needs to be something more even that uh, like uh, what happened in Bucha or in Mariupol or what is taking place in Kharkiv and other regions, it's not enough to be worried that you, you have to, uh, you need to have a kind of a, another global threat, which will be threatening somebody else as if Ukraine in itself is not enough for this, uh, for some effort to be uh, applied in order to stop these uh, atrocities. So uh, how, from the journalist's point of view, how do you also deal with that and what kind of uh, emphasis uh, you would suggest to put here uh, in order to somehow to take this, to grasp the situation as a whole, uh, just not to, uh, because in, in this framework, in this kind of discourse, so I totally understand that uh, Ukraine, as they joke, is kind of uh, the most northern part of the global south, right? But, but it's also that... Uh, it seems like that, uh, like Ukraine, uh, long been considered as some like periphery somewhere in the east of Europe, is not just uh, uh, what already happened is not uh, uh, enough for ta to take it really seriously in order to to take it as a global problem. You need like a kind of a, another global threat, uh, uh, as if uh, the threat from the Russian aggression is not enough. How do you? Uh, what do you think of this? And, and unfortunately, cynically speaking, it is like that. I mean, uh, unless, I mean, let's 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 take a look at the other global atrocities uh, in the world. The world hasn't really changed much in in not not in the coverage of them, but uh, in terms of, I mean, still there is this, this super cynical, super cynical term uh, in in journalism that defines. The priority of news it's the kilometers and the number of bodies and uh i mean not 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 for for good journalism of course but but let's face it this is how this this industry uh, predominantly works so uh, i think it's inevitable for journalists to look for the angles you cannot i mean there is no way to shock the world more than we already see. It, you know, at some point I felt that like each day you need you need to have even more shock. You know, we had this- you know, like, Can we kind of can we can they Yeah, yeah, yeah. The can we, can we shock? You know, I thought about that. Exactly, yes. Can we shock them more? Like we, we showed you Bucha, what, what else could be, you know, more horrifying? We showed you the bodies of the dead kids. I mean, the burned down, uh, cars with mothers pregnant women and kids killed there we 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 uncovered stories of of, of rapes and uh i mean what else could be there but unfortunately it is like that if you want to uh, if, if if you want to make uh 
some things relevant, you need to find you need to find the matching dots. You, you need to find the story that uh, the context that could could become relevant. I mean, I've seen the faces of the African journalists at the lecture of Professor Snyder about the famine when he specifically referred to them saying, this is your story now, it will become your story because uh, it, it will be the story of the famine in your, in your countries. And them raising their hands and saying, oh my God, we, never, we didn't think about it. We didn't think about it. now, as you, as you said, after you said that, it really seems that we had like a, a, a wrong angle or we need to take a closer look at what is happening. And unfortunately, it's like that. I mean, come on, take a look at Ukrainians. Take a look uh, at how the world is covered in Ukraine. I mean, we are sitting here now at the panel with Natalia, who is one of the best international foreign journalists in Ukraine, and she knows it's best. I mean, to sell a foreign story to Ukrainian newsroom, I mean, a story from Brazil or from India. In or... Yemen now, you know, what's happening now in Yemen? It's horrible. Who cares here, to be honest? I, I, I feel bad about that. But it's there are cholera, there are starving, there is famine, you know. And it's now. It's, it's something which is happening within the last years. Yes, and, or, and we know or, or that. Libya, you know, like... Or Libya or Syria. And we, 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 have, we have faced it as we worked um, together. I mean, our programs uh, about the world and, and the, you know, the, the, the events that were taking place uh, are just unimaginable on the conventional uh, TV station, on a conventional TV station. So unfortunately, that is like that. I mean, if you, if, if you are insular, as Ukraine unfortunately is, or Europe-centric, I mean, why would the world take huge interest in at what is happening here? Uh, but I shortly would add, I think that uh, it's it's very important, it's an incredibly important story of Odessa support, which actually uh, destroyed the Ukrainian economy, uh, first of all, for me. I do think that, of course, the first thing, uh, it's really about the, um, what interesting for me, you know, for me, the famine is something very, very, uh, you know, gross. It, it's horrible because we had Holodomor. What I really understood that those people in the Kremlin, but also in Russia, they just really fully don't understand that the rest they just thinks you, you don't do. You know, like, if, for instance, in the US, you won't speak about slavery. You just you just don't do these things. You, you can tell like, oh, you, can, you can't joke about, you know, slaves in some societies. And they don't get it, you know, like that some things, they just don't get it still why it's so wrong. To, to, to have even something similar. Why Margarita Simonian is speaking that famine would save us and why it's just beyond anything and why Ukrainians would really be very cautious despite, you know, it's, it's, it's not a problem for Ukraine. But in the end, in this particular case, I also think that, uh, mm, and some analysts would say that, uh, you know, I can't find the way. If the Ukrainian port is blocked, Sorry, but the World Food Program should find some way to feed those people. Bring those grain from the US, from Europe, from, from Netherlands, wherever. You know, like really, it's not, if it doesn't work, it's not the way to appease Russia and kind of, you know, like let, you know, uh, say, you know, let's, let's give her song and we would, you know, agree on that. But at the same time, take the responsibility to be, feed these people. Uh, uh, I, I, there is grain in the world. And I really would say like, even if this would be so, so solved separately, it's anyway separately should be solved whatsoever. Right, absolutely. So uh, our time is almost out for today. So thank you so much, Anelina and Natalka for uh, your participation. I hope uh, our audience also enjoyed uh, the talk as uh, I did. Thank you, thank you very, very much for your insights and all your work. I look forward to our further cooperation. And to our audience, I will have to announce at the very end that our next meeting within this Armed Democracy Series will be on Monday at 6 p.m. Central Eastern Europe, uh, summer time, which is 7 p.m. In, in Kyiv. Uh, on Monday, it will be a talk by uh, Karl Schlogel about um, German issues, let's put it that way. So thank you so much again. Thank you to Bina Varsava. Have a nice thank evening. You. Yeah.
Tchau. Thank you, Vasily. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Vasily. We were told we need to still stay for a bit.